My name is Annette Zumba. I'm 54 years old. It's April 26, 2008, and I'm in Sacramento, California with my sister. And my name is Jen Zumba, and I'm in my mid-40s, and it's April 26, 2008. I'm in Sacramento, California, and I'm with my older sister. I am here with my younger sister, Jen. There are seven children in our family, and we were born in just about eight and a half years. I'm the oldest, and Jen here is the sixth. After 25 years of raising us pretty much on her own, our mom experienced a fantastic revelation. She received a calling from God. It took two years for a religious order to accept her, and I was in my early 20s when I learned about it. It is remarkable how different each of the children responded to the news. But of all of us, truly, I do not know about your feelings, Jen, and that's the reason why I want you to come here today. Great. So my question first is, how did you find out? Mom came to my apartment. I was 17 years old and living on my own already. And she called up and said, I'd like to come over. And I said, wow, you're in town. <laughs> And she said, yeah, I need to tell you something. And I was worried at first. I actually thought that maybe she was coming to tell me she was getting married or something. But she asked that we spend time alone. And so my boyfriend left. And I went out to Sizzler's with her. And she proceeded to tell me that she'd had this calling and that she'd been feeling it for about two years and that she had been accepted into an order and she was going to go become a Catholic nun I was pretty supportive and excited and a lot of other things for her. At the same time, I was thinking, okay, I'm 17 years old, and it's what you're called to do, so just go do it. So it was, a, it was an interesting day because I just wasn't quite sure what it all meant at that point. The relevance of your age, that you were 17 and Joe was 16, is that mom could not enter the convent and begin her novitiate until you were both over the age of 18. Correct. So the two of you, in a little bit of a way, held mom back from doing that. How did mom talk to you about having to wait? Well, mom went into the convent basically at that point. She went in as what's called an affiliate, and so she was an affiliate to the, the order. And what happens when you're an affiliate is you basically act like you're a nun and you d just have not taken your vows. So she was inaccessible to us at that point. From that point on, uh, Joe wasn't even quite 16 at that point. And I was in college and had graduated from high school early and was already living on my own because mom had already started something where I needed to be out of the house. And, and so it was a really interesting situation and and she just she just didn't ever at least she never expressed to me that I held her back it was really that it just happened starting that moment we have an interesting dynamic in the family in as much as dad did not participate in our growing up and he really didn't open up his home to us immediately as being the only parent that was accessible it's a great word choice you had how did you feel about dad being the only source of a home to go to for things like holidays? That was absolutely frightening. And that was the roughest part for me about mom going in the convent is I suddenly didn't have parents. I really felt almost orphaned about this situation. I felt like, okay, what do I do for holidays? What do I do for college? And I, at the time, was applying to a, a school that would have paid a scholarship and I would have stayed in the dorms, but the dorms were only nine months a year. Well, everybody else goes home to their parents for the other three months. What am I gonna do, go stay in the convent? You know, it, was, it sounds silly, but, but I couldn't do that. And, and I couldn't rely on dad. Dad had already, at that point in my life, had told me I couldn't come home because I had only lived with him one year of my life, really, after age eight. And he and my stepmom saw it as a disruption for me being in their lives. And, and to be fair, they've since really embraced me and all the kids in a completely different way. But at the point that they were in their lives, they were not accessible to me. 
How did you talk to your friends about this? I had my best friend at the time was a gal named Leslie and Leslie and her parents had been really supportive of me the one year I did live with dad and they were Catholic and Leslie I remember telling me that mom was just getting the best of both worlds she got to get get pregnant and be married and and have a husband and then go be a nun so she was just stealing the best of both worlds so it was a very interesting situation because for me, I really did see mom's calling. I really saw the grace in it. I really saw the love and the commitment and everything else in it. But at the same time, I was feeling completely abandoned. So I wanted the support of my friends. And I either had friends who completely didn't understand it. How can you have a mom that's a nun, you know, and have 60 different questions for me? Or Leslie, who actually understood it and who didn't agree with it. So I didn't really talk too much about it with my friends. It was a rough situation for me to have the no one really to communicate to. I ended up communicating to a priest at my college in my college years for a little while. This brings me to the point of, of the seven children, you are the one that's stuck with Catholicism. You had a rough patch there, I know, for a while. But you have stayed with Catholicism. How has mom's calling calling affected your view of Catholicism? And how has it made you perhaps a more deeply religious person, having been associated with someone who was deeply committed to God? I loved watching the, the commitment mom had to God. And more so than that, it was the relationship with Jesus that she just, it was almost like he became her best friend and almost her love her lover and and everything that you could ever ask and so that part for me because I am Catholic is pretty beautiful to watch um, but that said watching mom leave us kids and Joe being younger than me and me going through some of the things I went through between the ages of let's say 17 and 21 I didn't want Joe to have to go through those. Joe was my younger brother, of course, and I didn't want him to go through those things. And I really resented mom being gone and no one stepping up and dad not being available and and a home not being available. And so I, even though there's parts in the Bible that say that if you give your life to, to Christ, he will watch special care after your family and and you know leave the dead for the dead and all these different phrases in the bible i didn't feel it as a 20 year old girl and really i very rarely use the word girl for anybody over over 16 that's female i usually use the woman word woman but i was a 20 year old girl in some ways and i didn't have a home anymore and joe didn't have a home anymore and so watching her have that beauty and, and grace and everything that I knew she was called to do was really beautiful. But watching what we went through was really rough. It was just, it was devastating sometimes. We grew up all traveling all over the country because of dad's work. And we still continue to be rather mobile. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Even at this stage. I mean, Joanne, our sister, the second oldest, our sister has moved something like 41 times in her lifetime, is um, there was something I thought quite significant for you and Joe, and that is we were all a bit older and we were used to moving around. We understood the packing, the unpacking, the leaving things behind, but we had our parents longer than the two of you did. Yes. How did we... What is your perception of your five older brothers and sisters, what we did or did not do for you? What's interesting is, and as you know this, I don't always have the best relationship with Tony, the middle child, but Tony stepped up big time for me while I was in college. I have to say, Rick had, Rick is my oldest brother, and he had always had this sort of almost like parental father figure for me. He had always stepped up as the male for me, always protected me, always uh, connected. So that was that that continued, although he was very introverted. And so as mom went in the convent, he became more introverted and, and withdrawn. So I lost him too, sort of. 
but Tony actually opened up his home to me. He had an apartment. And the summer that I did live at the dorms, he let me come stay with him. And so he became where I went home to. Now, mind you, then that Christmas he had a girlfriend and wanted to go to his girlfriend's house. And I didn't want to go to his girlfriend's house. So I had no place to be that Christmas. And so although my siblings, you know, some of us and Chris did the same thing, tried, you know, to stay connected, um, I still had to struggle. And so I was pleased with with some of the things that we all stepped up to do and and stayed connected with the boys really banded together so the boys really helped joe Joe a lot significantly um but but for for us you and me you were out of the house for part of the time when i was young while you were in boarding school and then you were out of the house by the time you were 16 or 17 years old and i was probably eight years old seven nine years old at the time so there was so much where yours and my relationship hadn't nurtured yet and hadn't uh, been cultivated. And my relationship with Joanne was phenomenal, but she was always traveling and in different countries and different cities. And so it was a rough patch for me. I, I have to say, when I look at people in their college years and they talk about how great it was, I, I just think it was mo- one of the most wicked times of my life until I was like 25 to 28 years old. But you're not that way at all now, and you haven't been for decades. What is it that mom did for us at a very young age that allowed us to band together, to grow apart, to come back together, but ultimately always watched each other's backs? We do. Uh, and I would say that what one of the biggest things that mom did is taught us always to watch out for each other, always to love each other, that love comes first, that you don't ever say... I hate you because no, 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 no. You say, I hate it when you do such and such. Um, She always told us to remember the good things that we loved about each other. We had meals together, ultimately. I mean, even though we were so scattered during the day, we all came home. If you were not home by 6 o'clock, somebody was looking for you. And that was a pretty (laughs) funny way of being. And then she always taught us that, you know, God gave us a brain, a body, a soul, and a spirit to pay attention to them. And so for, for me, I think that we all just, just always felt spiritually connected, even if not everybody has faith in Christ or God, but we always felt spiritually connected and we always felt like family mattered. And I think part of it was the moving. I, I got to move with my six best, best friends. Every, every time we moved, I already had six best friends. I didn't need more friends. That's a really good point. That's a very good point which leads me to tell you something that mom had given me, and maybe she shared the same thing with you, is um, there was an expression called, there is an expression where people say, there but for the grace of God go I, as if God is only paying, paying attention to certain people and God is leaving others behind. And she would say, God created the world in six days and God rested on the seventh And God is still resting. (laughs) The rest of it, our lives, is up to us. And the most committed wins. Without it being a contest, what we win is a good life. Yeah. I feel that despite the years between us and how very different our lives have turned out, yours and mine, the oldest and the sixth child, is we share a core value that she that is unshakable despite the fact that she went away and and you felt I feel appropriately orphaned despite all of that we have walked this earth as wonderful people yeah I think that often I think about the fact that you know mom raised seven children none of us are in jail none of us have gotten any big trouble all of us are extremely kind and loving all of us are willing to make a difference for other people, willing to step up, even through the introversions and the, you know, I want to just live in my little part of the world and have my peace. Even through all of that, we all are always willing to open a door, always willing to create grace. And, and I love that she gave us that. I, I can't fathom it. She was my best friend growing up. She was just so admirable so respectable and 
and out of that, I think because she was so respectable, she raised very respectful children. And I'm grateful every day of my life for that. And I'm being able to pattern that for my children, God willing, and, uh, you know, stay a respectful person. Now, mom had seven children before she was 28. Yes. You did not have your first child <laughs> until your 40s. And now you have two children under the age of five. And I've had 10 in the past seven years. As I've been fostering. You, let it be known that she is wonderful. <laughs> she is a foster mother. And not just a foster mother to any kids, but kids that are methamphetamine addicted or drug addicted or alcohol addicted. These are very special needs. Now that you have two very active children in your home, is how do you look at mom's job as being a mom of seven? I get stunned daily at how she ever was able to do the laundry. No, <laughs> seriously. I, I really just am completely stunned at how she gave us each time. We all got our own time with her and sometimes, and I don't know if you recall this. I don't know if it happened for you. That is the interesting thing about us being so far in the spectrum of the seven children. But for us, for the younger children, for our birthdays, on, on our birthdays, we got the choice to have dinner alone with mom and dad, or we got to have dinner with the six brothers and sisters and mom and sometimes dad, uh, whatever we wanted to eat at home. And so I, as a young child, always chose to be alone with mom and dad. And I remember going out for all these meals of just quiet time between us. And and she always gave it, you know. And, and that was her way of getting even dad to give it, which dad didn't do. But, but she, he did for that. He did for our birthdays. And, and I think that he, she just raised us really kindly and really also filled with joy you know I remember even when we were poor which we got very poor after mom and dad split and and I was very present to that for a long time because I was one of the younger ones we went to the movies once a month and no matter what mom would pay for all of us to go to the movies for a double show you know any food we wanted hot dogs popcorn sodas whatever because that was our treat once a month. And we got to rely on that. And even it didn't matter how poor we were on food stamps or or whatever. It, it didn't matter. We That was one treat that we got. And she granted us and gifted us over and over and over again in our lives. I feel that mom had a sense of purpose when she joined the convent because it was a true calling from God. I also felt as though when she had her children there was a sense of purpose in as much as her father, who was one of, the, one of the great treasures of New York as far as I was concerned, just a kind man who worked very hard on behalf of Jews during, the, during World War II. He was, well, he did amazing things. And she grew up with a great spirit, a sense of duty, like noblesse oblige and being poor at the same time. Right. Is, I think that stability of knowing that we are bigger than problems and smaller than God put us in our place, a rightful place in which we could interact with people very, very well. So I, I don't feel as though even, I don't feel as though the kids had any problem with mom entering the convent. Right. What I really think happened is that other people had a problem with mom entering the convent. As you said earlier, your mom has the best of all worlds. Well, I, I don't know. I think mom was very, very troubled when she knew she was going to be leaving the family and not being the mother anymore. Oh, I absolutely think that. For me, I was in college uh, and, and admitted I started college very early because of this. I called it a ping pong event between mom and dad with me in my late teens because both parents had different needs at the time, mom's calling and dad's needs that he had with his new family. And and I really feel that mom wished she could have been there for us, wished she could have had a home for us, wished she could have been there when Chris had his accident, he was hit on a moped, he was hit by a car, 
all these different things that she no longer could be because she was committed to to Christ, to the church and and her relationship with Christ. So for me, there is that noblesse oblige. It, and there is that there, but by the grace of God go I, that she did also raise us with, that you mentioned before. For me, it always meant, you know, you could in a heartbeat be homeless or you could in a heartbeat be paralyzed. And I learned that this year. And um, in in that knowing that, she always expected us to be prepared and to be loving and to be kind and, and to have people be able to contribute to people because you never knew when you were going to be down in the outs. But I think for mom, in, in many ways, when she first went in the convent, it was a very depressing time because she, although she felt all the love and all the connection that she had glorified with God, she also felt the trouble and the, and the grief of leaving her seven children. When mom dies, mm-hmm. how will you talk about her to your children? Well, I, they've not met her because of two things. They're a little active, and that has a little to do with the meth. Um, and mom has some troubles traveling, and then now I have troubles traveling. So we already talk about Grandma Jane. So we, we speak of Grandma Jane, and we, and we speak of... And Jackson loves her already. And, and we speak of loving her and how she is loving us all the time and praying for us all the time and that she wants for us good things and and we talk about what we want for her and it's it's kind of sweet it's actually quite beautiful what we have already and they have pictures of of grandma jane and so they know of her now they they know their other grandparents because we have spent some time with them and and so they have a sense of what a grandparental relationship is not that might not be the right word but but so they have that with grandma even though she's not there and every now and then they do speak on the phone with her but I will always let my kids know that that mom was really loving and really kind and and always willing to make a difference for us and for others and always dedicated whether or not she was dedicated to us when she was younger or dedicated to figuring out what was going on for her in her in my teens or in my late teens when she became dedicated to Christ she was always dedicated she just is she's also very funny extremely she has an outrageous sense of humor a true new york sense of humor yes tell a story just a off the wall story about mom and you or something you observed about her mom mom is an extremely funny um person and she's also as i stated very loving but i got uh, a letter from my grandfather saying that it, and as you and i both know grandpa was just a larger than life man in many ways he was six foot five and and just kind and generous and loving and giving and and he drank a little and had some other issues and he lied a lot and um i had not learned the lying a lot part and and so grandpa had sent me this letter about how he was thinking about adopting this 10 year old girl who was a black child from the south and and how he was just you know gonna give her a home and make everything right and mom came in and just started busting up laughing when she read that letter and she said your grandfather oh please you know he is pulling your leg you know and 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 he'd he'd she'd say these things about you know peeing on a pot you know and and these phrases that would come out of her mouth and and you know coming from this woman who was six feet tall all my life until she started shrinking um and and relatively thin while i was young and larger when when we got older she just had this this love and bliss of just humor and fun and and you know you could be grief stricken and she would come up with something i don't i'm not the best at memor, mem- remembering real stories so i don't know if you've got one that mom had i have one that therapists talk about <laughs> When we were very young and she would take us out, let's say, on a Sunday and she'd take us to a park. And so if we were eight, if there were seven kids and I was eight and Joe was, you know, just about one. 
someone had to hold somebody while the others were on the swings. And I remember it was Mother's Day and she took us to a park and everybody's pushing each other and we're all having laughter and it's very, very fun. It's girl, girl, boy, 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 girl, boy. And what she, she only asked us to do one thing for her on Mother's Day. Well, three things. Don't give her perfume because we would get the worst perfume in the whole wide world. Uh, don't buy her anything that reminds her of animals, no stuffed animals or anything. And to please call her Mrs. Zumba on Mother's Day. And so we would be swinging in the swings. And this was in New Hampshire when you were very young because you were born there. And Mrs. Zumba, can you push me? Mrs. Zumba, look what Rick is doing to me. Mrs. Zumba, Mrs. Zumba, Mrs. Zumba. And a person came by and said, oh, my gosh, it's Mother's Day. Are you doing this for a friend of yours, taking care of the kids? And she goes, no, no, these are my children. I remember. And the, the woman was just looking at her with, de and, and de with a deadpan look. Mom said, well, what do your children call you? And Joanne and I, because we were the oldest, we got it. And we knew that mom was just tired of seven kids saying the word mom 140 times a piece over the course of 18 hours she had had enough and one day she just wanted to be called by something else and I recognized at that moment that mom really was her own person despite the fact that we lived in an 800 square foot home with one bathroom and with the girls in one room the boys in one room and mom and dad in one room for five years we did that we danced around each other she made when you use the word grace several times now and it's true she was graceful absolutely Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because you mentioned this thing about calling her Mrs. Zumba and I, and if you don't mind, I want to interject something about mom going in the convent. So when mom went in the convent, there were a number of nuns that were not the most happy, just as my friend Leslie had expressed some issues about uh, her getting the both, best of both worlds. There were some of the older nuns that felt that she was only the fifth woman ever in the history of the Catholic Church to get to become a Catholic nun after being married, have children, be divorced, and then become a nun. So they rescinded my parents' marriage and our parents' marriage and uh, gave her the papal dispensation. The Pope actually signed a paper. Well, she, the thing that made her most uncomfortable was when we called the convent to talk to her. Now, mind you, I had been used to talking to her almost every day. So when we'd call, and we'd ask, can I talk to my mom or can I talk to <laughs> Jane? And they would not be too happy about that. And so she wanted to be referred to as Sister Jane. And she expected us all of a sudden, all seven children, just to call her Sister Jane while we were at the convent with her and when we made phone calls. For me, that was pretty devastating because I was already dealing with losing my mom. I was dealing with losing my foundation. I was dealing with not having a home to go home to. And I was dealing with being a, a late teen kid who graduated early from high school because parents were bouncing me around. And, and I was in college when I wasn't really anticipating being there without the foundation. So to add into that and make me call her Jane was really hard for me. So I didn't. I just didn't. Neither did Joe. So all the rest of you followed line and said, okay, mom is Sister Jane, and would call and say, hey, is Sister Jane there? And you guys would get to talk to her. I would say, is my mom, Jane Kelly, there? And they would let us talk. But it caused some resentment on some of the nuns towards her, which is not what I ever wanted to do for her. I wanted... For her to have the best life there but but I couldn't give her that that was one more thing that I just couldn't give her I can completely understand that and I'll tell you a story that maybe you're not aware of mom collapsed when she was living at St. Monica St. Monica's convent in Santa Monica at 4 30 in the morning she went to use the restroom and at 5 30 someone found her on the ground and she had blown up to the size of a whale and what had happened was she had an allergic reaction to a medicine. They rushed her to um, St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica. The only reason we found out about it was the day our brother Tony's daughter had had surgery on her face, and he called up Mom to tell her how Christine had fared. 
And they said, oh, I'm sorry, your mom's not here. Well, where is she? Well, she'll, she'll be in in a couple days. Well, where is she? Well, there was an incident, and she's in the hospital in ICU. Well, I lived only 40 minutes away from Santa Monica, and Tony called me. He lived up here in the Bay Area. And I was down there in 40 minutes, and I went into the hospital, and I was at ICU at the desk, and I said, I'm here to see my mother, Sister Jane Kelly. And they said, I'm sorry, nuns don't have children. Wow. And I stood there, and I thought I was going to be like one of those screaming women. And instead I said, my mom has bigger goals in life than to just be Sister Jane Kelly. She's also a mom of seven kids. Where is she? And they were, I was very, it seemed I was very disrespectful. But really what I was, I was so determined to see her. She had not known that the sisters did not tell us. She thought that they had told us. Wow. And that none of us was coming. So when I saw mom across the room and her head was the size of a basketball, she turned around. She goes, oh, dear, you didn't have to come. I could fare on my own. Wow. And I thought, but why should you have to? That was her grace. Yeah. That was really her grace. And the doctor, when I saw him later, said, your mother was so lucky she would have died. She would have choked to death on this medicine that it just made her grow and grow and grow. And I remember growing up as a Catholic girl and going to Catholic boarding school. I was never disrespectful to the sisters. But I have to say that this was my mother. And I was not going to be the one to call the rest of you kids and say, oh, by the way, mom passed away in yeah. a toilet area. That was just not going to go down well is I went to the head of the sisters and I said, I appreciate the fact that you have this band and these rules, but the truth of the matter is, whether you like it or not, she's the mother of seven children and she is not going to die without one of us being there. And mom said that the complexity of the relationship between her and the nuns changed after that night. It became apparent to them that they were being a bit selfish, that they were being a bit unruly about her situation. It was now, oh my God, do we want to make the call and tell them that their mother has passed away? So all throughout this process, from your age to my age, from the locations of where each of us found out about this, to all the steps that it took to her becoming a sister, it sounds to me that despite the six and a half years difference between you and me, we very much felt the same thing, but it only showed up in different ways. Yeah, I think all seven of us really adore mom. I think we always did. I think that all seven of us supported mom towards going to the convent. Um, the day she took her first vows, all seven of us were there. And it was like watching a wedding. It was this stunning thing. So I think we all, all really respect mom and and allowed that choice and and really believe that she should have the right to make that choice and and she should respond to a calling if that was what was going on I think what happened that's very different for you and me was you were much more established in your personal life and I Joe and I were not yet and even Chris to some extent and so that struggle as that went on um, became much more apparent. And, and it wasn't wholly her responsibility. It was, as, as you stated, that Dad had never been really a great part of our lives growing up. He'd been traveling a lot, and he was very busy, and, and he was not necessarily interested in raising the seven of us, but that was more Mom's job. And suddenly now he was married to somebody who gradually integrated us back into his life so that was great but yeah all of us all of us love her and respect her and and like her and um because of the situation I think Joe and I have a little harder time now you know because we went through the things we went through and and became disconnected you you had to we had to as young people we had to become disconnected to her so that she could be connected to them and, uh, that is very interesting. It's how it felt. She had the ultimate connection 
with yeah. the thing that many people, millions of people, try to attain. Um, and in order for that to happen, in order to really serve her, we did have to step back. Yeah, It's not often that children have to step aside. Usually it's the parents who step aside so the children can do what they want. But really, en masse, we all changed so that she could do what she needed to do. Yeah. And, and in doing so, at first we were fragmented, the seven children, and we would ha- try to help each other out intermittently. And over time, we've created our own foundation as seven children. Well, I have to say of all the children, you were the one that created home. Yes. You have the home. You've got the Christmas tree. You've got the beautiful china. You make the food. You do what you would have dreamt about or what you did dream about all those years ago. And I think that you more than make up for the loss that any of us may have felt for those Christmases and for those birthdays that were not shared together with mom. And because she had the vow of poverty, we couldn't get her any gifts. Everything was just so austere for a while. And so, you know, kudos to you for having the children that you have and creating the life that you have and always being gracious but also because you have had a tough time with these children in addition to your adopted children you've had many foster children is that you've allowed us to bear the weight of your either grief or loss or how tired you might be is you seem to surrender quite easily um, into your siblings' lives as we feel connected with you. But you deserve a lot of credit for creating a sense of home. You, as mom had a purpose with God, you had a purpose with home. You were bound and determined that this will never happen to foster children or to children that that need a place to stay for a night. You've always made your home that way. Yeah, well, so for me, that's my purpose for God and with God. I felt, even as a young person, you had a friend, Penny Poole, who they ended up taking in a foster child at one at one time. And for me, I always thought, even when I was eight years old, that I would foster. I would foster and adopt. And I always knew that if I got married, I'd have one or two children of my own, and then I would foster and adopt. And what happened is I fostered, and I adopted my boy, and then I lost one of my foster children. He passed away. And you guys stepped up and and came. And I was grateful to my, my belief in God and our Heavenly Father and our eternity that I knew that my boy would go to heaven, that he's my boy and nobody else's boy. And my siblings were pretty respectful of that. And I really appreciated that. And so, yes, there have been times and moments and everything else, but... For me, my grace and my calling, as mom's calling was to go to the church, my calling was to create family. And that's what's so funny is mom pushed me really hard when I was young. Don't get married before you're 21. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't get married before you're 30. And, uh, and don't have children. And don't have children you know, until much later. And don't have many of them. And, and here it is that that actually was my calling. And so I pushed people away when I was younger so that I wouldn't end up in a committed relationship, so that I wouldn't end up making, quote-unquote, the mistakes that mom and dad made. And instead, what ended up happening was that I got, I finally came around when I hit 40 years old or late 30s that I get to be with. So it seems to me you are the one child in the family that literally came full circle because of mom. Yes. And with mom. Yes. Yes. That's where I find it so interesting because I'm the oldest. I got to spend the most time with mom. But time and intimacy are two very, very different things. And I think the intimacy that mom feels with Christ, the intimacy that you feel with the church, and the intimacy that was lost between you and mom as daughter, mother. Yes. All of that has been replenished. Yes. And it's because of your will, your free will, to create for yourself an atmosphere of loving, home, safety, a harbor. And the rest of the family totally acknowledges 
the strength and the guts it took for you to get to this place on your own, not being married, not having a man in your life. You just stuck to your guns. And that's where you really are mom's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> I had never thought of that before. But you are more her. Oh, look at you. You look just like her when she cries. <laughs> When you put all seven of us kids together, we we all look like our mother, and um, and yet we feel so individual and yet so intertwined. Yes, we've been blessed. We've been blessed. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. <laughs>